Watch this. No new trial. That's the verdict for former lawmaker Aaron Von Ellinger, four months after hearing his guilty verdict for raping a 19-year-old State House staffer. His argument for a new trial was something his lawyer could have offered, but didn't during the trial. Idaho now has one of the country's most restrictive abortion bans in effect. But after a judge put one part of that law on pause, we're hearing from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle about the law and the court's decision. Boise parks are a beautiful facet of the city of trees. In fact, they call them jewels. Well, one of those jewels needed some serious polishing at first, and now it's one of Boise's favorite spaces. Former lawmaker and convicted rapist Aaron Von Ellinger will remain a convicted rapist and will be sentenced next week for sexually assaulting a 19-year-old Statehouse staffer. Today, nearly four months to the day after that conviction, a judge denied Von Ellinger's request for a new trial. In court today, Von Ellinger claimed his constitutional rights were violated during his previous three-day trial because he didn't get to question his accuser, something afforded him by the Sixth Amendment. Well, the judge didn't buy that argument. Andrew Bartline, who was there for that trial four months ago and listened in on today's proceedings, <clears throat> excuse me, help us understand how, this, how we got to this point. Because what's interesting about this Sixth Amendment argument is that his attorney had a chance to kind of bring this up during that trial, but didn't, right? Right after it happened? Yeah, John Cox, his attorney, had the option to do that right at that moment during the trial. Now, Jane Doe did take the stand and originally uh, during that trial, but she technically didn't testify. So there's some mm -hmm. nuance here, and we'll get into it and explain that. But the specifics are the actions in that courtroom were well documented by journalists, most notably um, people here in our, in our uh, at KTVB, excuse me, um, and on day two of that trial, Jane Doe answered questions from the prosecution, details about how she met Aaron Von Ellinger, leading up to what happened at Von Ellinger's apartment where Jane Doe says she was sexually assaulted. It was right at this point where Jane Doe couldn't continue with her testimony. She says, quote, I can't do this. Then she left the courtroom. The prosecution could not convince Jane Doe to return to the stand. At this point, Von Ellinger's attorney, John Cox, did not get the chance to cross-examine Jane Doe. Because of that, the defense can ask for a mistrial. They're entitled to that. That opportunity. Judge Reardon, knowing full well, addresses that concern. He asked John Cox, Von Ellinger's attorney, let's address the elephant in the room. Would the defense like a mistrial? Von Ellinger's attorney, John Cox, says explicitly to Judge Reardon, not at this time. The trial continued forward as normal because Von Ellinger's defense chose not to ask for a mistrial. So in response, Judge Reardon tells the jury to strike Jane Doe's testimony from the record to act as if it never happened. So that's the nuance. Jane Doe took the stand, but the jury could not use her testimony in any way. At that moment, Cox had no problem continuing forward with the trial without cross-examination, but now he's raising a problem with it, saying it violated Von Ellinger's uh, Sixth Amendment rights because he didn't get to face his accuser. The way that this trial went down and the idea that the state, and again, this is their new method of prosecution in these kinds of cases, don't call the victim, don't subject that victim to cross-examination, and don't make that victim confront who it is that she's accusing. And um, so from the standpoint of the Rule 29 motion, Judge, I, I don't believe that the state produced the evidence to let the jury support that charge of rape. Cox also supplied new evidence for a new trial. Cox says his witness supplies information that shows inconsistencies in the prosecution's case against Von Ellinger. However, after reading that affidavit, Judge Reardon says this new evidence also shows inconsistencies in the defense case. And at that time in the trial, the judge says the jury had all the information they needed. And they were free to believe or disbelieve the defendant or the statements that were contained in Nurse Wardle's report. And they chose to believe the statements in Nurse Wardle's report, having been given the opportunity to see the defendant, listen to him testify, and judge for themselves his credibility. Shortly after, Judge Reardon decided to check the calendars and determine what a good sentencing date would be with people on both sides of the aisle there. Aaron Von Ellinger will be sentenced next week. That will be August 31st. That is next Wednesday. Okay, a couple of things, Andrew. Uh, in regards to not being able to cross-examine the witness or the victim, excuse me. 
Uh, I, the interesting part that's brought up, I believe, was the judge who brought this up, like in a murder case, that doesn't happen either. The state would be the one that they, could they argue against, correct? Is that, was that brought yeah, up today I mean, by the judge or by the prosecutor? The language was the harmed party. Right. And I believe that the defendant brought it up, uh, John Cox. And then the judge says, well, if somebody is, is murdered, you can't talk to the harmed party, they're dead now. So, like, this whole logic of you have to face the harmed party doesn't necessarily make sense. The state is the accuser in this. Right. And the state had a, had a case put forth with witnesses and testimony, and it is the state in this case. And technically, she did not take the stand, so therefore, she wasn't really part of the trial to be cross-examined. Exactly. Kind of I mean, it, it was stricken from the record. Okay. And it is interesting that he had a chance in the middle of that, on day two, to say... Yeah, I don't like the way this is going. I think we should redo this, and he didn't choose to do that. Yeah, and he was asked explicitly by the judge, would you like to file a mistrial? And Cox says, from the defense, no, not at this time. All right, so sentencing next week, as you said, on August 31st. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right, Idaho's new abortion law is now in effect. It began at midnight this morning. The law is one of the most restrictive in the country. Outlaws all abortions in Idaho except... Well, three exceptions, case of rape, incest, reported to law enforcement, both those cases, and where the mother's death is imminent. The Dobbs decision changed that, though. The U.S. Supreme Court earlier this year changed the abortion status for the first time in nearly 50 years, giving the rights back to the states to decide what they want to do when it comes to abortion. Back in 2020, Idaho created a law just for this moment, a trigger law. A federal judge ruled last night, though, Idaho's law partially interferes with the federal law known as EMTALA, which says medical providers that accept Medicare funding must provide care for patients in an emergency situation to stabilize them. Well, EMTALA includes abortion care if a doctor believes that is necessary to treat a woman experiencing medical issues, a pregnant woman. So what do Idaho Republican and Democratic leadership think of this ruling and the possibility about altering this law? Here's Chief Political Reporter Joe Paris. Less than 24 hours after a federal judge partially paused a section of Idaho's new abortion law, legislative leaders are diving deep into the implications of the new trigger law. Republican leaders say they disagree with Judge Lynn Windmill's decision. We're disappointed. We were hoping that the judge would go another direction, but it is what it is. And we're now in the process of discussing with the attorneys what we need to do and what our options are going forward. House Majority Caucus leader, Republican Representative Megan Blanksma, was a sponsor of the 2020 abortion legislation that is now law. Idaho Republicans have spoken out on the federal court decision saying, for now, Idaho must yield to the federal EMTALA provision, allowing abortion care in emergency situations at a different threshold than state law allows. I think that it, it was a clever way for the Biden administration to get around a Supreme Court decision. I think that's what it is. And I, I think that what we learned from the Supreme Court is that they believe that the states have the right to regulate abortion. And so I am disappointed in the decision because I don't think that it falls within what the Supreme Court has determined. But again, our lawyers are looking at what paths we have going forward. And so actually we're gonna meet on that today and, and hopefully we can have a better understanding. We thought it was important to speak up in light of the important ruling yesterday. Idaho Democrats gathered at the Capitol in Boise to speak out on the new law Thursday. They were critical of comments made by Republicans saying they will continue to battle the federal's court to partially limit the abortion law. It was stunning. Uh, when you look at how narrow that ruling was, the ruling really just says that doctors will be permitted to provide emergency abortions where it's necessary to save the woman from catastrophic health consequences. So we are only talking about situations here where a woman is facing a life-threatening infection, loss of a body organ, paralysis, I mean, serious, you know, major health consequences. Democrats had hoped for a pause on the new law in general. A partial injunction is valued by Dems, but it is not the result they were hoping for. The law that these folks passed says that the doctor can only perform abortion where death is certain. So if there's a 50-50 chance of the woman's death, that doesn't get the doctor off the hook. The doctor could face five years in prison for saving a woman who only has a 50% chance of death. Um, we are fortunate that this federal judge stepped in to save us from the application of that law. And it was stunning that Republican leadership said they're going to fight that ruling to the end. Republicans at the State House believe that the Idaho law leaves room for medical providers to make correct medical decisions, regardless of what MTALA says. 
Blanksman says the Idaho law considers medical emergencies. And that's why that's in there. It, 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 it's not as if we didn't consider the health of the mother when we wrote the legislation. And that's why it's written in there. So this, this false narrative that the Democrats and the Department of Justice and the administration keep pushing that this is some sort of total abortion ban is completely false. That is a false narrative. Why are they appealing it then? If this is what they, if, if, if they say it's implied that there's some exception for women's health, then why are they so outraged that the judge is trying to make that clear? That's all this judge's ruling does is make clear that yes, you can treat a woman where there's a health emergency. Republican leadership is saying unacceptable. We want to overturn this ruling and make clear that there is no exception for the health of the mother. Do you think about coming up with any legislation to, I guess, amend the, the abortion legislation or do you like the way it is still? Well, I think that's all what we're looking at as far as what we do going forward. And, and I hate to get out ahead of anybody uh, and talk about how we would amend something before we understand what paths we have available to us via our attorneys. We're going to fight this for all we're worth. We are going to hope that somebody listens to our call today to stop litigating this. Uh, failing that, we certainly hope that voters will pay attention to this <laughs> in November. And it's not just women. There are a lot of men who have women in their lives who hopefully don't want to see them you know, dead or suffering grievous health consequences. Um, we are in a completely unacceptable situation right now, and um, our laws need to change, our lawmakers need to change. You either trust the process or you don't. We disagree with the decision, but right now we're looking at what we need to do as far as process. So where do we go from here? Is this the end of the road? Not quite. You may remember that the Idaho Supreme Court is also studying some Idaho abortion laws. Later in September, the Supreme Court in Idaho is going to take up some cases. We'll see where that goes. You also need to remember that the federal court, they gave a preliminary injunction and only a piece of the law. Now, the word preliminary is big here because that does mean that this will come back to a federal courtroom and we'll find out at that point if that preliminary injunction will become permanent or something else could happen. Brian, the Bottom line the, at the end of the day, though, here in Idaho is that there is the new abortion laws on the books. That trigger law is on the books right now. So for the most part, abortions are outlawed in the state of Idaho. Civilly and criminally. Correct. But there are those exceptions in Idaho law, regardless of EMTALA, regardless of what was going on in federal court. There is um, the consideration to save the life of the mother, and there's cases of rape and incest that are reported to law enforcement. So that is the law of the land right now. We'll see if that changes at all in court. And when you say in court and the preliminary injunction, this does give us an indication which which way this judge may be leaning, though, for possibly making this in a permanent injunction on just that part right. of the law. And so that would be probably the expected outcome is that the preliminary injunction becomes permanent. Another thing is that a lot of states were looking at Idaho to see what happened here. The decisions in Idaho could impact other places across the country, so it'll be interesting to see how Idaho's decision really impacts the rest of the country. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. The City of Trees is making a case to be the city of parks, at least along the river. The Ribbon of Jewels, they're called. Well, we're telling a story of the latest gem that had a less than sparkling start. Do you have any gems you'd like to share with us? Some random thoughts or piercing commentary? We're listening and reading. Go ahead and text us at 208-321-5614. But we'll listen, too, because you can leave a voicemail at that same number. And remember, we'll be sharing some of your thoughts and comments at the end of the show.
With a river running through it, the city of Boise has a rich resource that was once, well, not treated like one. Sewage, trash, erosion, all of that was adding to the Boise River getting run down and not exactly a desirable place to be. Well, about 50 years ago, that all changed with the creation of the Boise River Greenbelt. That Greenbelt would be the thread that connected a series of city parks that lined the river. A ribbon of jewels, the city would call it. The ribbon being the Greenbelt, the jewels being the parks honoring some of Boise's finest civic leaders. Things like Ann Morrison, Julie Davis, Marianne Williams, Kristen Armstrong, all of them named for women. Well, the latest addition, Esther Simplot Park. Yes, Mrs. Simplot is the widow of J.R. Simplot, the famous Idaho potato magnet. But she's also known for being a strong supporter of performing arts around town, creating the Boise Opera Company and then the Performing Arts Academy that bears her name. And now she was known as one of the most unique and popular parks in the city of trees. Where the western edge of downtown Boise meets the Boise River sits Esther Simplot Park. It's a 55 acre park, uh, roughly about 22 total acres of water. All of which gets used. Arguably the most popular location from June through August anywhere in any of our park system in the city of Boise. And I would, I would say probably as popular as anywhere in Idaho. But before it became fashionable, this stretch along the river was less than suitable, as shown in this flyover film from 1970. It was a gravel pit with just a bunch of like trees and stuff around here. To turn a pit into a park took a specific perspective, an idea initiated with an ice rink. Idaho Ice World was built by the J.R. Simplot Company in the late 90s. By the early 2000s, J.R. was looking to unload it, so he sold it to the city for a million dollars. And the agreement was that once we paid the million dollars uh, for Idaho Ice World, the Simplot family would turn around and donate that money back to the city to purchase the remaining acreage of what would become Esther Simplot Park. Paying for the land was only part of the plan. The Simplots also wanted a piece of the park's design. And then Scott Simplot, uh, he was a genius on this design. He wanted the ponds to connect with each other and he wanted them to connect with Quinn's. They broke ground in late 2014, intending to have it finished in a little more than a year. However, breaking that ground on Pond 1 uncovered some unsavory stuff. But in uh, removing dirt to uh, create a larger body of water, uh, we did discover some contaminated material in the dirt. As they started removing the unsuitable product, they kept finding more, including cables, concrete, petroleum, and even half a dozen drums of waste. And so that pretty much halted construction. Cleaning it up pushed back completion by about nine months. But by November of 2016, yeah. Esther Simplot Park was open to the public. The culmination of a vision, the significance of which was visible even to the park's namesake. The community's just gonna enjoy this forever. Huh? It has so many things that children and people can do and enjoy. I don't think there's any other city that has this type of, uh, of a group of parks and for the enjoyment of their people. Where those people can enjoy and access acres of water without even leaving downtown Boise. The biggest amenity is the fact it's a water feature. And so there are channels that actually uh, folks can start in Quinn's. They can channel through into Esther Simplot Pond 1, and then they can go through a channel um, with a footbridge over the top of it into Pond 2. And then you could either get into Veterans Park Pond or you could jump into the river. But I think it's the picturesque piece to it too as well. Um, not only are there beautiful views wherever you're at in this park, but if you're on the south side of the park, you have this amazing view of the foothills too as well. Well, that $1 million price tag at Idaho Ice World sold to the city by J.R. Simplot's companies was significantly less than that property was worth. Overall, the park cost $16 million to build. But Esther Simplot Park has not been without its problems since its opening. For several summers, one or more of the ponds have been closed by Central District Health because of high levels of E. coli. The city has been working on a solution to get additional water rights to bring in more fresh water from the Boise River and keep that whole thing circulating. And it seems to be working. With weekly testing, those ponds haven't had high levels of E. coli at all this summer.
Say, I want to do a weekend forecast for the mountains because when we have a 10 degree drop in temperature here for the valley, it, it can make a big difference in mountain locations, especially Stanley. One of the coldest spots, of course, not only in the, in the state, but possibly even in the country. And you notice that with the cooler air that's expected for the weekend, that Sunday morning at Stanley could be down around the freezing mark. There it is, down to 31 degrees, okay, with a high of 76. Some of the mountains will be seeing some thunderstorms. That's true in the Stanley area. As you look at Sun Valley, not so much there. Low temperature for Sunday morning, about a 40, and highs will be in the lower 70s. This is going to be beautiful in the mountains. And when we look at this chance of thunderstorms, it's just a slight chance there for Saturday afternoon, even in McCall. So down here in the valley, we've got heat for tomorrow, but then we're down to an 88 on Saturday. Sunday is 85 degrees. Lows are in the mid-50s for some of those mornings. These temperatures are going to come back up, but this time it's only for a short while. But in the meantime, enjoy the weekend. All right, so looking ahead at the next seven days, it's great, but what if you're wondering what the weather will be like, like months ahead? You know, you're a planner. Well, you're also in luck, because earlier this week, scientists, hydrologists, meteorologists, gists of all kinds, well, a bunch of them from across the region got together to talk about what we can expect heading into fall with regard to the drought in the Pacific Northwest. Troy Linguist is a hydrologist for the National Weather Service here in Boise. And the gist of it is, he says temperatures are fall for this fall, I should say, are trending above normal, while rain and snow, that's looking to be below or at normal levels. So that obviously won't be good for the drought, and it's expected to continue, like through the end of November, according to the numbers. But a larger weather pattern may affect what we'll see past this fall, because we've been in a La Nina pattern since 2020. Linquist says, looks like La Nina, they're gonna, it's going to continue over the winter months. But there's an end in sight to that, too. And La Nina is expected to continue um, into the winter, although chances of uh, that continuation do uh, trend down. They are still favored to continue into the December and February uh, uh, period of 2022 and 23. And then as we move into the springtime, we can see that ENSO neutral um, conditions are favored. A lot of uh, words there that scientists use. Well, La Nina basically is that long-term weather patterns created by ocean temperatures around the equator. And usually, but not always, La Nina leads to cooler and weather winters across the northern U.S., including up here in Idaho. If this happens, it will only be the third time, though, that we've ever had three La Nina winters in a row.
All right, we got some comments to get to at the end of the show, like we usually do, like this one from Chuck. Brian, once again, it's not the Biden administration that stopped this portion of the law. It was a poorly developed law by the Republicans. If they are that concerned with life, why did they not talk to medical professionals? They are creating law without their constituency support. Shame on them. They need to quit selling out Idaho. We've got one more here. feel really disgusted seeing a legislator actively say they are frustrated they can't let women get life-saving care when they need. The abortion ban is already draconian, but keep fighting for a provision in the bill that literally will let women die terrifies me, says Jacob. And this one, well, the e coli from Esther Simplot Park seems to have moved to the Idaho State Legislature, says Bill and Eagle. Oops.